Women have power, but we don't always look at the barriers that hold them back. So what I know is that if you invest in women, it's been shown time and time again, they invest in everyone else. And that's what lifts up the family, that's what lifts up a community, that's what lifts up an economy. Hello, I'm Vandita Mishra, National Opinion Editor of the Indian Express, and I'm thrilled to be in conversation with Melinda French Gates. She is co-founder of one of the largest and most influential philanthropic foundations in the world, a businesswoman, a computer scientist, an author, and a leading voice on gender equality across the world. My first question uh, to you is, that you have been increasingly talking about ways to empower women. In fact, you have tried to shift the uh, discourse from women's empowerment to something that you call the uh, full power of women, uh, the real lived power of mm. women. So uh, what is this distinction that you make? And secondly, how has the pandemic been a setback to this? Mm. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, women's power, rather than us empowering women, women have power, but we don't always look at the barriers that hold them back. So, for instance, I think of the difference of empowerment versus power as if we help a woman get a job, a really good job, let's say, in society, maybe it is in the formal sector here in India, but we don't make sure that she has a place to put her child, she can't live her full power because she can only do that, that job part way. Or let's say that she actually gets a bank account, but she can't use it, she can't access banking service, then she doesn't have her full power. So I think we need to stop talking about empowerment and make sure that we help women come into their full power in society. You know, I think COVID set women back, we know for sure, uh, because it pushed around the world so many women out of the formal sector, out of their jobs. And what we're seeing now is this child care crisis. Women don't have a place to put their children to then be able to go back to work. So that's one example of where the pandemic has set women back. So in India, for instance, uh, I mean, it's not just the pandemic, of course. Mm. So in India, uh, you have this situation where in many, um, you know, graduate and postgraduate degrees, uh, courses, you find that women outnumber the men. But you, at the same time, at one end, you have high dropout rates of girl students, and at the other end, you have a workforce where women are completely inadequately represented. Mm -hmm. So uh, where do you think are the stubborn glitches? Well, you're pointing out two of them, right? Mm -hmm. Both at the bottom and at the top of the pyramid. Yes. So I think in terms of keeping girls in school, we need to look at what holds them f back from staying in school. Mm -hmm. Often it's menstrual management and hygiene. Mm -hmm. If they live in a place where they don't have access mm -hmm. to the sanitary napkins that they need, they can't stay in school or they drop out or they miss seven days. Once you've missed seven days of school, you cannot keep catching up, mm -hmm. so especially seven days a month. So I think we have to look at what holds girls back, and we have to do specific programming for that. And then in the formal sector, we need to make transparent what is not transparent right now. Like, what is it? Why are we only getting women to the very top, teeny top echelons of society, very few of them? I think you need to break down the sectors and say, what is men's versus women's roles in each job level and what are their salaries? And talk to women and understand what keeps them from progressing in their job. You're a philanthropist who is also a woman. Do you think a female philanthropist is different from the male. Do you think that the, a female philanthropist comes to this, to her job or to, a, to a, with a different set of priorities and also with a different approach? Do you think women listen more or do you think they are more interested in stories mm. and relationships? I know a female philanthropist mm -hmm. is different than a male philanthropist. Mm -hmm. I also know a female politician mm -hmm. is different than a male politician. Mm -hmm. I know a female businesswoman mm -hmm. is different than a male businessman. Mm -hmm. So. We bring, I think women bring a different lens to society than a man does because we have different lived experiences. Mm -hmm. We are often the ones who are asked or expected to take care of the children, expected to take care of our aging parents. 
some of that is loving work we want to do, Mm -hmm. but some of it is also very laborious and tedious, and it keeps us from taking, getting our PhD or taking the job we want. So I think we need to look at all sectors and say, how do we make sure that women have seats at the table at equal numbers as men? Then society will change. But yes, I think I have a view of society that's different than a male philanthropist because of what I see and what I learn and I hear for wi- from women. Mm-hmm. So this is also a time when uh, populist movements have come to power, when nationalist assertions, you know, are, you see them across the globe. So um, for philanthropy, uh, there are, a cert- are uh, various challenges. You have to deal with suspicion of NGOs, of foreign Uh, forces that many of these movements that have come to power have and promote and nurture. There is also the fact that you have to navigate, you know, a way in which you do not, you you work with them, you partner with them, but you don't get associated with their agendas. And there's a third set of challenges here, which is that Many of these nationalisms, uh, they, ha- they create problems in, f- let's say, the public health sector, as we saw in the pandemic, you know, America first or India first. So how would you respond to these three sets of challenges? Well, I would say that as a philanthropist, we have to know first and foremost who we are and what we're about. And what I know what I'm about, which is I believe all lives have equal value. And I'm interested in working with governments that have that same stance, that they want the world to get better for their citizens. Mm -hmm. Governments are put there by their citizens. And so government is there to serve citizens and to make the world better. And so we work, for instance, in India in deep partnership with the government. It has to be the government's priorities for the people. And luckily, in this case, the government, we have very shared priorities, which is how do you make sure that people have a better life by first starting with good health? How do you make sure that women are brought up in society to their rightful place and have the services that they need, but also are empowered, for instance, economically? I was incredibly impressed that during the, even during the pandemic, because of all the digital rails that have been put in place in India, you know, 470 million bank accounts have been opened. 50% are for women. That is because it was purposefully done that way, and I think that makes a huge difference. But what about the suspicion that uh, many of these governments regard, you know, you and other foundations with? I think, you know, by showing up and doing the work is the way to bust through the myths. I mean, they're myths, they're suspicions, there isn't much we can do about that. But we can say, here's who we are, here's what we're about. What the Gates Foundation is about is making sure that everyone can live a healthy, productive life and they can thrive. So we do deep technical work with the Indian government on health. We do deep technical work on digital bank accounts. If you have a suspicion about why we're helping someone with health, I'm not, we can, all we can do is demonstrate that this is what we're about. Um, and I think after a while, people start to realize, no, 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 they're, they're both living their values and they're speaking what they mean. And the damage that these nationalist assertions can do in the health sector? It did not benefit any of us during COVID, right? We should have had a worldwide response, a worldwide surveillance response, a worldwide response on diagnostics, a worldwide response on vaccines. And even in the United States, our own nationalistic instinct kept us from doing that. So when people think of inequality, people don't necessarily uh, resent the wealth of the wealthy, but sometimes they resent the power of the Mm. wealthy. So, you know, foundations such as yours have such a tremendous influence and, you know, agenda setting power. So there is an obvious, you know, um, conflict with democratic and accountability. Mm. So how do you navigate this this challenge? Mm. What we try and do is follow the path that was set by the UN, these sustainable development goals that were set out. And there are targets for, you know, maternal mortality, bringing that down, childhood mortality. So we use that as a blueprint. We work in deep partnership with the government. We let the government lead. We bring our skills to bear. But we're not setting the agenda. It's the government's agenda in health. 
Do you worry sometimes that uh, while philanthropy has done such a lot of good that it has helped del deliver vaccines uh, in, during the pandemic, for instance, but you know the, the criticism is also made of that it avoids or sidesteps structural change. That you know things like medium wages of labor or uh, skewed taxation regimes, those kind of issues are perhaps attention is distracted away from them. Well, I think you have to be careful in philanthropy. I mean, I think you have to come at it with a lot of humility. And all I, I can't speak to what other philanthropists do. I can only speak to what we do and what we know. We believe that all lives have equal value, and yet the world doesn't necessarily treat them that way. Mm -hmm. So we take the resources that have come to us uh, in society, and we are trying to spread them on behalf of others. But we're trying to do them in very technocratic ways that we think can make a difference. When you look at your own foundation, do you sometimes worry about, you know, sometimes the bureaucratization that can set in, sometimes the, you know, what it can make you lose in inventiveness mm. or in uh, risk-taking capacity? Mm. There was somebody very wise who was our first president of global health, and he said that bureaucracy is the death of a foundation. Yeah. And I believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we have to constantly do is make sure that we have the right people, that we continue to innovate, that we continue to listen. Anytime you run an organization, you have to be careful about bureaucracy. I heard you say in an interview that, um, you know, if you could speak to, your, to who you were at 25, mm -hmm. you would say that uh, the girl you were in high school uh, if you could learn to re-be that girl, mm. you could grow into the full woman that you could be. Mm. What did you mean by that? Well, I went to an all-girls high school. My parents believed that my sister and I should go to an all-girls high school. And I was surrounded by women who said, you can be great in math, you can be great in science, you can be great in the humanities. They taught me computer science. I knew then who I wanted to be in the world. But sometimes when you go out in the world and then you do work in the corporate sector, you assimilate into that world. And what I had to learn is to go back to who I was in high school and say, I can move forward and push forward, even in fields that I don't know very well. I can continue to learn. And so I think I've come back to be that person and to be a continuous learner. My last question. So you've also said that the investment in women actually gives the greatest returns. How exactly does that, I mean, what did you mean by that? Well, because we know that when you put a dollar in a woman's hands or a few rupees, she spends it differently than her husband does. There's very good research on this. He will often spend it on himself or spend it on a luxury good or a cigarettes. She will spend it on behalf of her family first. And so what I know is that if you invest in women, it's been shown time and time again, they invest in everyone else. And that's what lifts up the family, that's what lifts up a community, that's what lifts up an economy. And enlightened governments are starting to realize that, that if you want a good engine of economic growth, you want to do well by your women. And um, I think we see India doing that. Thank you. Thank you.